temple built for her right there. So on that spot, they built a temple to the goddess Diana. And so people would come from all over the world to worship this goddess in Ephesus. That's what it was known for. How would you like to, as a Christian, live in that city? <laughs> I mean, you were talking about a minority. How would you like to be some of the first converts in Ephesus? Where people had no concept of biblical godliness, of sexual morality, of honesty that was based on a respect for God's commandments. And so there were times when they felt like a fish out of water. And the more they grew in Christ, the less they identified with the culture of their very city. And so it's to these people that Paul writes this. He says, through him, we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household. He's saying God didn't leave you out in the cold. You are connected with the most important one. Your, your, your father is the greatest father, and you're part of the greatest family. And to the Galatians, he's urging them to be benevolent, to watch out for each other. And he says it this way. He says, therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Now, all people are important to God, but there is a special connection for those who have named Christ as Lord. And it connects them with God and it connects them with each other. And it gives them a special love for each other and a special obligation to each other to take care of each other. So being in the family of God has benefits. I mean, when you think about it, it's pretty amazing that the pure and holy Son of God is willing to call us his brothers and sisters. Uh, Hebrews chapter 2 comments on that. He says, both the one who makes men holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. Let me, let me just stop for a moment because this process of becoming holy is because he paid for our sins put our trust in him, he applies it to us and he washes our sins away. He, he, he cleans up the record. He wipes it away. For our sake, God made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. 2 Corinthians 5.21 And therefore he can say, so Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers course by implication and sisters. Jesus is not ashamed to call us his family. Now, <laughs> I'm going to guess that if you have siblings, then there have been moments where you were, oh boy, I don't even want to admit that I'm related to you. <laughs> I've never had that moment myself with my four sisters. Well, maybe with one of them. No, never, never. <laughs> you can go back and tell my sister that I said that, Dick. <laughs> but, you know, like our physical families, we love each other despite our imperfections. Despite the fact that sometimes we drive each other crazy. You know, when our, when our children were younger, weren't sure they were going to both survive. We, re we still remember one fateful trip to Alabama. I was invited to preach in a gospel series down there. It was the hottest summer they'd ever had. And we were going in July, and we had an unair-conditioned Chevette. 
the kids were in the back seat. We put a cooler between them to separate them because it was, he's touching me. She won't stay on her side. We finally said, shut up. You know, you've heard of families, they stopped at a rest stop and they took off not realizing one of the kids they left behind. We were hoping. <laughs> it didn't happen. Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah, some of us have ex actually experienced that. But now they adore each other like they're best friends. So there's a, there's a lesson in that. Don't kill them when they're young, when, they, when you, you're fed up with them, because they will grow up and they'll get better. Just so have hope for the future. They'll, they'll make it through the teen years. You might think they're driving you crazy, and they might actually, but you'll make it. Just hang in there. Last week, as we were kayaking and canoeing down the Allegheny River, I thought about what James Dobson said in one of his books. He said, when you're raising teenagers, you'll go through calm sections of peace. It's like going down the river in a canoe. And then you'll go through whitewater rapids. And you'll think it's going to overturn. And everybody's going to drown. He said, when you're going through the rapids, the worst thing you can do is stand up in the canoe. So he said, don't overreact. Just stay hunkered in the canoe and paddle on and ride it through, because you're going to come to a calm section again. And I thought of that a lot. Well, compared to Jesus, we all have many perfections. So his family, the ones he is not ashamed to call his brothers and sisters, are far from perfect. And yet, he is willing and eager to call us his family. And he says what he wants from us is to do the will of his Father. You know, and anyone asked that, oh boy, can I say that I do the will of my Father? I mean, I, am I living it perfectly? That's not what he's asking. What is the will of his Father? The will of his Father is that we would trust him as our Savior. That's the will of the Father. And that places us in a sacred relationship with each other and in a saved relationship with Jesus. And that also means that we must deal with each other with integrity and with humility. That means that we can no longer use the, the selfish, sinful tactics of the world, those tactics that dishonor God. You know, talking behind people's backs, uh, talking people down, holding attitudes that we're not willing to say honestly to each other, but acting in ways to try to get across that I don't like you, there's no place for that in the family of God. The church, the family of God, is where we learn healthy relationships. To speak to each other if we have problems with each other, to work them out. Remember, Jesus said, if you have something against your brother, lay down your offering and go work it out before him, before you offer the offering or the sacrifice to God. Wow. And he said, if you have a, if someone sinned against you, go to him. If he doesn't listen to you, take a couple others with you so there's some credibility. If he doesn't listen to that, bring it to the church. It's so important. You can't have those corrosive relationships where people are unhappy, dissatisfied, nitpicking each other, saying things about each other, feeling things about each other. We've got to keep it clear. I mean, we all enter the family of God with faults. There's, a, there's an interesting passage in the book of Jude, that, that simple little one-chapter book. It's verse 22 and 23. says, Be merciful to those who doubt. Snatch others from the fire and save them. 
I suggest to you that most of us come into the family of God smelling like smoke. We've been snatched from the fire. And so that means, the, our assumption should be that each of us needs teaching and help and guidance and correction and encouragement, lots of love and lots of forgiveness. And that's exactly what the instruction is we receive from Scripture and supposed to be from each other. And so while Paul was sitting in jail writing to the Colossians, commending them for many things, correcting some false teachings that are creeping into the congregation. He says this, and I think probably it's what he wants them to remember most. He says, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. That's a pretty high thing to ask, isn't it? And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Wow. If we would remember that section of scripture, maybe read it every day and say, and then pray, Lord, help me to fulfill that in my life and my relationships with my fellow family members. Test your relationships with that. Am I forgiving whatever grievances I have? Am I clothing myself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience? Am I bearing with my brothers and sisters? Because when Jesus says, Who is my mother? Who are my brothers and sisters? The answer is, we are. Pray with me. Father, and we call you Father because if Jesus is our brother, you're our Father. Thank you for sending our older brother to redeem us. Help us to act like him, to get our cues from him, to imitate our sibling in heaven. And help us to feel like family. And help us to invite others to be a part of your family. No, we're not part of an exclusive group, exclusive club. We're part of your family, and you love everyone and want everyone to be a part of that family. So help us to, to proclaim the message of your love and of the redemption that Jesus brought with his shed blood. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Let's sing together. Let's encourage one another as we stand. God is my Father, and Jesus is my brother, and the blessed Holy Spirit is my guide. The devil's no relation, for I'm a new creation. I'm a member of the family of God. God is my Father, and Jesus is my brother, and the blessed Holy Spirit is my guide. The devil's no relation, for I'm a new creation. I'm a member of the family of God. Father, bless us as we leave this place and help us to love each other like you love us. In Jesus we pray, amen. God bless you.